Let's meet our panel, shall we? Our Canadian industry leader from the BDC, well, welcome back to the stage, Isabelle Hudon. Welcome back, Isabelle. Joining her will be Senior Advisor, Technology, Strategy and Transformation, Mathieu Laroche. And joining them will be Product Owner, Analytics and Applications at BRT, Philippe, Philippe Desjardins. Nice. Yeah. Look at that. His family's here. Isn't that nice? And uh, also co-founder at Pace Factory, Sean Clare. I think, I know, right? Sean's given it his all. And Vice President of Canvas AI and the man with the coolest hat in the building, uh, Joseph Zankiewicz. Thank you so much, Joseph, for being here. Our startup is Axia with Felix Belil Dockrill is with us here. And our research chair of artificial intelligence for supply chain management at l'Université de Québec à Rimouski is Lubna Benabou. Merci for being here. And running this whole operation is not me, thank goodness. It is the VP Data Science at Ivado Labs, Marie-Claude Coté. Take it away, Marie-Claude. Thank you. Bonjour à tous et à toutes. Et bonjour, Isabelle. Euh, C'est un plaisir de m'entretenir avec vous sur le sujet de l'IA dans le domaine manufacturier. I'll switch in English so all our visitors can follow along with us. So Isabelle, you lead the BDC, uh, Business Development Bank of Canada. Uh, for those who might not know, BDC is uh, focusing exclusively on small and medium-sized uh, businesses. So with the perspective you have, uh, what is your assessment of the maturity and pace of adoption of AI in manufacturing in Canada? The very short uh, answer is very low maturity and very low adoption, but let let me uh, expand a little bit more, uh, Matt Claude. So BDC is a bank. Uh, it's first and foremost a crown corporation, but it's a bank. And as you said, it's exclusively dedicated to support SMEs in Canada. We do serve 100,000 clients across Canada, and just a little bit less than 25% of those clients are from the manufacturing sector. So I, I, I do think that we're quite um, credible talking about, and not me, myself, but BDC, we're quite credible with the data we have talking about the adoption and the maturity of adoption of AI. Again, very low adoption. I do think that there's a first and foremost, and I said it this morning, so uh, sorry if I do repeat myself, but it's something that we have to keep on uh, saying. Um, in Canada, we do lack adoption of technology to start with. When we do compare uh, our country to other countries, um, digital adoption is pretty low and way too low if we want to be better and more productive. So how can, it, it, it's, it's a tough one, Marc-Claude, to ask SMEs to do a leapfrog over uh, digital adoption and go right to the AI adoption. So it's, um, it's, it's, it's quite a journey. Uh, I, I do think that all of us, um, researchers, uh, academic people, and you, entrepreneurs, and us, uh, leaders in the field, we have to develop a more uh, tangible narrative around first benefits of AI. Also, we do talk about AI too often in a very complex way and showing applications that are, one, very expensive, two, uh, quite inaccessible for SMEs. And we should come back to a narrative that makes it just a little bit more simple. <laughs> um, and, and making it more simple, I do think, will inject some adoption and some speed in adoption. But adoption is very low. Not to say that some of our clients have not adopted mm -hmm. AI. But when they do, Marie-Claude, it makes a huge difference. And the, 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 the growth and the scaling of their business is very much impressive. Interesting. So 
there's an interesting paradox, right? So while AI might be the solution of some struggle that these companies may have, um, they're not always inclined to invest, maybe because they don't know what AI can offer to them. So it makes me wonder, uh, how can we adjust the supply? So is the offering we're, we're offering to the market uh, align with the needs of these businesses? Well, I, I do think that to close the gap between the offer and the adoption and mm -hmm. the consumption of or the integration of, of AI, it starts with not necessarily selling the technology, but education. I do believe that we it's non-negotiable to train uh, entrepreneurs and the business community mm -hmm. on the many benefits that AI can bring into um, into one business and into their businesses. Um, and that's where and, and how my team is thinking of how do we need to bring education first and foremost? We're a bank, and often we go to the solution of financing or investing, but we also do advisory services that plays a huge role into education. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's, it's not necessarily first and foremost the, 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 the financing that is missing. Mm -hmm. It's the education to bring a certain level of knowledge and recognition and, and also role models out there other than the ones that we see that are like huge deployment of AI and highly complex. Yeah, yeah. Keep it simple, right? Keep it yeah. simple. Even if it's not simple. <laughs> and not that I, 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 I want to brag being one of the oldest on the panel, but maybe it shows and maybe it doesn't show. But I remember um, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, I was leading the Montreal Board of Trade. And at the time, it was impossible to have the conversation on replacing uh, a human by technology. You would remember that at the time, um, le niveau de chômage was pretty high and it was forbidden to have that conversation that technology could replace a human being. We're in a complete different situation and it will not change. Labor shortage is there and is here to stay. And really, not only digital adoption, but AI can very quickly and fast solve for the labor shortage. And I think that now we're in a new era or a different era where we're more than allowed to have this narrative out there saying, well, stop fighting again labor shortage by trying to steal employees <laughs> from your competitors. Not, not that you're not allowed to do this, but this will not solve the challenge we have. The challenge we have is to bring new ways of doing business so that we can keep on scaling our, our companies. Yeah, makes sense. Um, I know we're short on time. Uh, there's still one question I'd like to ask. So you've been exposed to many entrepreneurs tackling AI, even if not all of them are doing it. Uh, do you have some insights on the ingredients for success uh, to succeed in that transition? Um, I would say curiosity. Mm -hmm. uh, is one of the uh, key elements for success. I'll use another C word and is courage. Courage to try and not necessarily by thinking that you will win it all, but you, we have to try and we have to bring those new technologies within our um, enterprise to see how it can change. But I, I would say that curiosity is probably even more important than courage because if you don't have the curiosity to understand what it would change, Mm -hmm. then it's not worth going to the second C, courage, because you don't know the worth of, of, of bringing uh, AI. I've seen and I visited many of our clients that have integrated AI, and I was having a, a conversation with our dear professor here, and, and of course, when it's a new company that just started with a CEO that is less than 40 years old, it does help to uh, speed up the adoption and to, to, to think first and foremost with the technology and to start with the technology. Not to say that if we're older than 40, it's impossible, but there's a mind shift mm -hmm. that is required. And 
and I've seen it. I've seen new companies bringing AI right at the get-go, but I've also seen the second, the third generation of a company bringing technology in, in a very simple way. Mm -hmm. And some of the entrepreneurs that I met with um, decided to go abroad and shop around the world to see what would be the best to bring in their walls to gain productivity. And they've all reverted back to Canada, recognizing that the know-how and the knowledge is quite uh, impressive here in Canada. So they're curious, but they come back to Canada. Exactly. Oh, so they perfect. go shop around, they get <laughs> inspired, but they, they do recognize that in Canada, we're quite a leader. Oh, nice to hear. Um, I know we, you need to leave us. Um, we still have 30 seconds. Uh, any word of wisdom before we let you go? Well, I hope that the panel, and here I have more the academic uh, side of the story, and that uh, entrepreneurs um, inspired uh, all participants on, on how you embraced that journey, how uh, you made it possible, maybe not always easy, and we have to multiply the number of role models that uh, we see publicly, so I wish you a very good conversation, and I hope very shortly that we'll talk about many good uh, and simple examples on how uh, AI can um, raise productivity. We'll keep that one in mind, the <laughs> simple part. Merci beaucoup, Isabelle. Merci, Marc Claude. Right. Merci. We can applaud Isabelle as she has to leave us. Have a good conversation. Thank you. Okay. So I, I, I'll even move. I'll, I'll turn to our panel. Um, um, so, the first thing I want to do is for you guys to introduce yourselves and also to give us example of, uh, of application of AI that has been successful uh, in your context. So, I'll start with uh, Mathieu. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mathieu Laroche. Uh, I'm offering consulting services with a uh, small and large organization. Uh, what I like to do the most is really uh, arrive at the beginning of a project. Uh, evaluate the situation in the manufacturing industry. That's my force. I've been in there for almost 20 years. I uh, see the uh, opportunities to bring technology, AI being one of them. It's important also to realize that uh, AI doesn't solve all the problems and sometimes it's super expensive and there's technologies that are way simpler to implement. Uh, I will work with uh, people on the shop floor, uh, meals leaders, even business leaders, strategize also on how we'll implement those uh, business cases and find really the bottlenecks where we should start first. Uh, today, I'll start with my last uh, experience with the last two years and a half with Kruger Products, which is in the pulp and paper industry. Uh, we've launched a, a big program uh, funded also by the help of Scale AI. Uh, at the Sherbrooke Mill, which was a, a mill that was built uh, four years ago. So um, really a, a great place to start because there was some, uh, I would say, assets that were really digitalized. So the data was actually more accessible than some uh, manufacturing mills that are older. So that's also a challenge I'm sure we'll discuss today. Um, and then it's to those use cases where, for example, uh, related to the supply chain. So it's uh, demand forecasting really at the beginning of the supply chain. Uh, there was also, of course, uh, productivity. So making sure the assets are running really at their best performance. So with set points and machine learning, you can also optimize those assets. Uh, other use case were predictive maintenance. It's a popular one in the manufacturing world. Um, there was also uh, planning, so production planning. There's a lot of uh, different inputs when you plan the meals, different lines, different shift, day and night, you don't have the same performance, all that stuff. So there was a great use case with that. And the program, of course, is continuing right now. The business units and the team that was also built with that program from zero person to now 15 uh, software developer, full stack uh, data scientists also is now way autonomous and scaling that program to other meals. So that's super important also. That internal team work with some external firms, uh, some Quebec based, some international, so they've learned with them, but they're also able to maintain those solutions and scale them to other meals. So I think that's something super important as well we'll discuss today. Thank you. Philippe. Thank you. Thank you, Marie-Claude. Uh, welcome, everyone. 
a lot of the things that Matthew just mentioned will really resonate with me. Uh, I work at BRP. I'm a product owner in analytics and digital product. Um, what we've been doing at BRP in the last few years is really try to insert the most intelligence as we can in the, the process uh, revolving everything from customer demand, customer need for a product, up until uh, the market planning of this, of this product to the delivery and the final sale. So we really try to uh, insert intelligence in everything that comes before the production of the product uh, and the delivery to the customer, but as well as uh, every other downstream process uh, as we're trying to explore to, to uh, insert into artificial intelligence and more initiative. Um, the reason why in my title there's two parts, one is uh, AI and the other is uh, digital product, is because um, whenever you build an AI product, there's always an output to this either model or, uh, or optimization function that you built. But without the correct tool to consume this, uh, this output, well, you, you just produce uh, data that it just piles up on your, in your data warehouse. So what we've been trying to do is really build the right tools uh, with, with our user, really trying to understand what are their needs. And we've been trying to build the right tools to, um, for them to use the output we produce. And we're really trying to tie a need, a pain point in the business to a solid use case for AI and not trying to do the other way around and just saying, hey, AI is cool. I want to inject this in my business. Mm -hmm. We're trying to start with the need and finish with AI. So we've been par partnering with uh, Eva Dolabs to, to accomplish our product internally. And we've been powered with, uh, by Scale AI for, uh, for the latest uh, innovation we've done in terms of AI at BRP. Thank you. Thank you. Sean? Hi, I'm Sean Clare. I represent uh, Pace Factory. We're a, a video analytics software company. Um, I've been in the manufacturing industry since I graduated from engineering school um, 30 years ago. And um, what Pace Factory does is we use video cameras from you know, security cameras that are already existing in manufacturing facilities, or you can add um, additional video cameras. And we study motion basically with, um, with the cameras using computer vision and different um, machine learning and AI type of algorithms. Um, our biggest use cases are for safety. We started in safety because it's about safety of people in, in uh, manufacturing. And then that extends into, um, we have use cases in efficiency, um, quality applications, and ergonomics. So, um, and the way that that's all kind of been brought together, the first thing that we did when we started introducing the use of cameras to monitor motion and processes in manufacturing is we uh, got a patent on ghosting. We call it ghosting. It's anonymizing people. So a lot of people are intimidated by the idea of being watched, even though there's lots of cameras in society today. Most of them are used for theft prevention or after the facts, um, accident recreation or investigation. Um, so we ghost the people, and it's not about identifying a person and what that person's doing wrong. It's more about understanding um, the problems that exist that are preventing us from being more productive in, uh, in the manufacturing environment. So our use cases have been um, primarily around what we call standardized work. It's part of the Toyota production uh, system. A lot of the work we did with Scale AI around developing a standardized work optimization mm -hmm. engine using AI was um, to see you know, what are people supposed to be doing and what's actually happening. Um, and when you can add video analytics, that, that we, um, Steve and I, the founders of the company, came from another company that did a lot of monitoring of what the machine was doing. You can get sensors and signals from machines, from PLCs, and understand the efficiency of the machine. But the machine is constrained by what the person is doing. There's always people involved in the manufacturing process. Um, so with video, we can now understand what the person's doing. We can censor a person, if you will. Um, and understand, are they following the right steps in the right sequence? And it's not with the intent of making, it's, it, the intent is to make the people work with the machine to be more efficient, to make our companies in Canada more productive and compete on the world stage. And what we, we've been able to effectively do is help people work at the right pace, um, not work too fast or too slow, and to do things in the right sequence. And the biggest challenge that's out there in manufacturing is understanding the problems. What, what are the problems that people are facing and, and so we can go and, and solve those. So the video analytics really helps you understand the current state so that you can spend your time on solving the problems versus spending your time on um, 
on discovering what they are. So that's what we're about. Very nice. Joseph? Hi, I'm Joseph. I'm uh, with Canvas um, AI. We're Canada's leading industrial AI software company. We've been in business since 2016. Uh, we're venture backed by Google and Yamaha. We um, largely are focused on the process industry, the heavy process industries. Um, this would comprise oil and gas, uh, chemicals, petrochemicals, uh, metals, uh, food processing uh, um, manufacturers. And um, we, are, we have been working on what we would describe as a next generation AI experience where we're largely focused on developing prepackaged AI solutions that focus the user on business value versus acquiring data. Uh, we have built a, a warehouse of about 50 of these prepackaged solutions uh, that can be applied immediately. It's just simply adding data and go. Um, process engineers don't need to become data scientists or AI specialists. And um, the, our approach relieves them uh, of spending a lot of time in Excel spreadsheets monitoring all kinds of conditions. Um, the uh, solutions are, are pretty vast in that they span anything from predicting equipment failure in an oil field to reducing energy and water consumption to monitoring mass balance in a refining operation. And um, we're finding that customers are able to achieve quick value uh, and um, in as little as 60 days versus what happens today with most of the solutions, which are largely tools and parts, takes some months to achieve any kind of value. So this is sort of our go-to in the market, and it seems to be catching on fire. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so it's interesting to observe. So we have Mathieu and Philippe that are adopters of AI, and Sean and Joseph with the Pace Factory and Canvas AI that are provider of AI. So I guess you have different perspective on, on challenges. Um, I'd like to hear in your different contexts um, talk about two challenges that we often see. So first, how do you make the case for tackling AI to your client or higher leadership to convince them that it's a good idea? And then how do you foster adoption? Because we often know that the people deciding to bring AI to a business are uh, rarely the people that are impacted right, by, the, by the, the, solution, the AI solution. So, so I'd, be, uh, I'd be curious to... Let, let's start by Sean. Um, you put really uh, humans at the center uh, of your, yeah. your pitch. Uh, I'm curious to have your take on this. Yeah, so I think one of the things that's happened in manufacturing is that we treat the operator as you know, the, the, dis the disposable asset in the business, right? Whenever there's um, you know, a cost reduction, it's always about how do we reduce the cost, which often translates into you know, how do we get rid of people? Um, we've done a lot of that in manufacturing. We've replaced people with robots, and those make sense in areas where the, the robot can do a better job than a person can, or it's awkward or lifting or things like that that, that, that people don't want to do. Um, but I think what we've lost focus on is, is, is the person themselves. And, and I heard earlier that there's a, you know, there's a labor shortage, right? We don't have enough people, mm -hmm. um, and I think we don't treat the people well, so one of the things we've discovered is that through using this use case that we did on, on understanding standard work, which is the work process that people are supposed to do, a lot of people, when they start in manufacturing, they feel like they need to be keeping themselves busy. So they're working really hard. They're doing things, but they're not necessarily working smart. Um, they're doing things. And if they're not doing them in the right order, they're upsetting the whole process, which has automation, robotics, and uh, a lot of moving, other moving parts that aren't human. Mm -hmm. Um, so what we've learned is that when we, once we've implemented and understand the current state, that if people work in the proper um, process and pace, that's why we named the company Pace Factory, it's what is the proper pace that people should be working at, they actually find they have to work less. It, their job's actually easier to do because they work at a slower pace, but they're doing the right things versus making themselves look busy. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's an important thing to consider is that um, using the tool in the right way, the tools that we have in the right way to make the operator king. Let's give them everything they need to be successful, um, as opposed to treating them like they're kind of a disposable, low-cost asset that we can swap in and out. 
and maybe foster retention, right? In right, the world. right. <laughs> Joseph, anything to add to that? Our experience has been that, and we work with process engineers on the, on the plant floor, not just the C-suite, is that most of these people don't trust AI. And just remember that in the manufacturing environment, when stuff goes wrong, stuff blows up. It's not like an e-commerce play where I haven't met my numbers. So it's pretty dangerous. So they're very safety conscious. So this business of building confidence and trust in what you're doing is very, very important. So as a result, we, when we work with our customers, we have them focus on the small, low-hanging fruit problems that can be solved. And that builds confidence, and it, it also delivers immediate value. So you have to take those small steps before you start scaling anything across an organization. And if you do that well in one plant, and this is our experience where we work with multinationals, we don't work with SMEs, um, uh, it's just that when one, one plant gets on fire, it spreads to other plants almost naturally. So while the sales process and the deployment process on the first implementation is excruciatingly long, that cycle shortens as you build confidence within the, the, the workforce. Hmm. So in your context, Philippe, uh, how is it going? Well, okay. Adoptions and... Convincing, I guess. Sure. In terms of adoption and, and executive buy-in, it's a, it's always a, a hard sell if you don't start with the pain point, as I mentioned earlier in the introduction. So um, one of the massive failure we did in the past, and I, I want to advise everybody to to uh, pay attention to that, is really start with a use case that uh, higher up and uh, process uh, process optimization group pointed as being non non optimal, and we wanted to optimize. And we, we just started with, a, with this process, and we started digging into it and providing uh, use cases. But we never really talked at that stage mm -hmm. to users and what were their pain point. And we did it e eventually, but we, we had to recollect two versions of the same problem into a single one, and that made the adoption way harder. So if I ever have one uh, advice to, to tell the, everybody here in the room, it, it would be to be sure that your AI project, like any transformation and digi digitalization uh, initiative you, c you could have, does not only come from higher up and, um, and down, and but also trickles from the bottom up. So it needs to come from both places. Only one will not stem um, adoption, and the other will not stem uh, customer buy-in uh, and executive buy-in. So you, you need both to have a success story. Uh, and don't rely on only one of the two uh, and expect the other group to uh, adopt it eventually. Yeah. So your users are selling the, pr the product? Of course the they solution. are. Of course yeah. they are. Anything to add? Uh? Well, I think those are great points. I mean, uh, hopefully to convince upper management, they understand increasing productivity is something very interesting also. Uh, I think right now with the solutions and the systems that are more and more being implemented in manufacturing, there's a lot of data available. And of course, that data is traveling very fast. So decisions can be uh, made way more quicker. Uh, I think uh, you see more and more uh, operators, people on the shop floor being overwhelmed as well by the tons of new factors they need to consider when they make a decision. So uh, they're looking for help. Uh, I mean, they want, they know those tools exist. So uh, for me, it's important also to, to go to the, put your boots, go on the shop floor, understand where are the bottlenecks, where are the pain points, and those people working day to day with that, with the data, you understand quickly where where to start, uh, and don't have to be a, a crazy AI use case. I think Isabel was uh, <laughs> really right about that. I mean, when you start your AI journey, you start with just the data, making sure it's quality data that you can access it. You have the technology also already on your floor. Um, and just visualizing the data, I think this is just a, a win. Uh, a lot of people in the shop floor are working with intuition. They have like 15, 20 years working with those assets and all that. And now you show them a nice graph of, of that parameters for the whole day and they're just like, Looking at it, seeing, oh, wow, it's the first time I see this. And you're like, it's crazy because you have the right intuition most of the time, 99% of the time, but I mean, you still don't have access to that data. So those small steps, I think, just bring value right away as well and create really solid foundation for those AI use cases. So, um, and, and you need to start. I mean, competitors will are starting or have 
already started. So um, you can't be just expecting that humans will be uh, at the same uh, at the same level as human with tools using AI. So you need to bring those tools in. And I think the youngest generation as well are more digitalized. They're they're, they're fast with their thumbs, <laughs> if I can say it like that. They've been they've been raised with iPhone, iPad, and all those tablets. And and we see more and more of those tools uh, in the manufacturing uh, industry. So they're more used to those type of deep diving in the data and scrolling and seeing graphs and all that. So they are in demand, and I think that will also uh, create retention with the workforce uh, and keep your your people happy. Thank you. So we, we talked about our, about, uh, a lot about where to start. Um, but when I was preparing for the panel, I was thinking, hey, I think I did a similar panel like three years ago, and everyone was talking about POC, proof of concept. Uh, you're actually all quite advanced in your journey, right? So, and I guess uh, that comes with scars and hopefully a lot of learnings. Um, do you have some learnings uh, for, for the audience uh, on how to go from the POC to more robust production uh, code and, and scaling to multiple businesses. Uh, um, well, yeah, well if like, I may, Marie Claude, yeah, yeah, um, go ahead. I'd like to, to start with uh, the concept of data. We, we've said it in the past uh, a lot of time, data first, be sure that you have the data. But we were talking backstage earlier, and um, a, a nice uh, argument was made for be sure you have the data for your use case. You don't need to bring your whole enterprise data in some place before starting to work mm -hmm. with it, but be sure you have your data, the data right for on. your use yeah. case. Because okay. if you don't, well, you'll have roadblocks down the road. You'll have frustration with, for, uh, from stakeholder. Hey, wh why is this project not moving forward? Well, we don't have the data yet. So this, this is a, a real first step to, to do. And we don't need to overcomplexify, as uh, Joseph uh, said earlier. But then afterward, we need to remind ourselves that data science holds the word science, because science is experiment. Mm -hmm. And experiments can fail. And we learn from those. But it does not mean that um, Every data science initiative will hold a strong result. Sometimes we need to leave some behind, so hence the reason to do a POC. And there are different phases to AI projects. A POC is a good one, but then when you go to, OK, we have a use case that works, the POC uh, ended up giving a result, being fruitful. Now you need to put it in production, and you need to have the right skills on your, on your bench to, to put it in production. You can't just expect um, data analysts and data scientists to, to bring the whole big data pipeline to the, to the rendezvous, because we're going to miss it. We need data engineers. We need people that are um, fluent with more concept robu rob uh, robust pro um, processes of uh, productionization and like DevOps, CI, CD, and uh, cloud computing, cloud, uh, cloud um, yeah, computing, basically, mm -hmm. to put your code in there and, 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 and operate it. So there, there's two parts. Be sure data is there. Be sure to be ready to fail. But if both works, well, be sure to have the right team on your bench to, to productionalize mm -hmm. your product. Good points. Matthew, you. do you share the, the same kind of story? Yeah, I agree. I mean, uh, to, uh, I think some, some lessons learned is really to have a team in place. I think uh, one thing I can be sure it's important is start thinking about your talent stream. Uh, it's easy to go see an external firm. They show you nice PowerPoints and all that. Seems great. But at the end of the day, when they give you back the product, the code, the puck, or all that, it's yours. And an AI project is it's not like a, a product that is will not grow or will not evolve. It needs mm -hmm. to be maintained. The things are changing. You're changing equipment and all that. So you need to re, 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 uh, retrain or even just update your models and all that. So you need some people internally that understand your landscape uh, so they can maintain it. And then hopefully they can have enough time to grow and scale it with other use case, other meals and all that. So uh, do not forget your, your talent stream. Make sure they are at ideally at the beginning with the external firm. And they learn together. So the knowledge transfer is just uh, seamless. Mm, good point. Joseph, is it the same reality uh, in your world? You know, it's funny. This data first is a real, I don't know, someone sold something here because we've spent trillions of dollars on data infrastructure and storage. In our experience, the amount of data that's used to solve a problem 
very focused problem is probably 10 to 20% of that data. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the POCs and pilots that we're talking about, it's spent the time spent in discovery. 40% of the time spent on, well, what, what can we solve with this? And so the real key is, again, focusing on a business problem and then having the software being smart enough to say, hey, you can solve these, you have this data, you can solve these problems, and by the way, here are the models that can actually help you solve this, mm -hmm. and then automate the deployment of that, and then the adjusting of that, mm -hmm. and operationalize all of that. So this is where sort of next generation AI is going, and then when you start adding generative AI capabilities to this, guess what? I'm working with synthetic data. I don't need everything that's been collected in the cloud. So it's I think we need to take a rethink about mm -hmm. what we're doing with the cost of storage and cloud service. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. No, I, just, just to build on that, I think um, one of the things that you pointed out was the difference between problem finding and problem solving. There's a, there's a lot of tools now that are available to help us find the problems faster. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people today are still stuck in the, the mindset of, you know, I've got to go and discover the problems. There's a lot of problem finders out there that spend 40, 50, 60% of their time finding problems. Um, if we can use some of these tools that are available today and, and build the use cases to demonstrate how they're being used to find the problems faster and communicate what is the, we, we were working with Toyota and they, they, their feedback to us was that the, the biggest value you bring to us is you help everybody understand the current state or what the current problem is. Mm -hmm. Solving it is easy when, you under, when you're all in agreement on what the problem is. Um, so I think, it's, it's over, the challenge is overcoming that mindset of I've got to be a problem finder mm -hmm. to, be, to, to use your time more wisely to, to solve the problems as opposed to, mm -hmm. to find. If I, if I may follow, because some of the problems are hidden. They're pretty obvious. So I'll give you an example. We have a large food ingredient manufacturer in London, Ontario, and uh, they generate their own electricity to produce food ingredients. They come in raw at one end of the factory and they come out as powder at the other. So they use natural gas to run cogeneration units. Every single unit, and they had three of them, they're all run as silos. Mm -hmm. We walk in there and we're saying, wait a minute, if you don't silo these, in other words, connect all this data, we should be able to optimize this. Now the problem is most engineers will run on the basis of, it's working, why fix it? Right? And it's a bit like your 1970s Honeywell thermostat in your living room, and it's always set at 72. It doesn't matter what's happening in the room or outside. But then Canvas AI arrives, and we have the Nest. And so this company managed to save, with a very um, meager investment, uh, three to four hundred thousand dollars a year on energy consumption. So energy reduced, three to four hundred thousand. Now, there is a side benefit to using AI in industrial manufacturing, and it's sustainability. They reduce their carbon emissions by 4,000 tons a year, okay? You can take those carbon credits to the bank, and it's sort of changing the mindset, and this is one of the reasons why what we're doing on the plant floor is making its way into the C-suite, because the CFO is concerned about emissions. He has to report on it. So industrial AI is probably the quickest and the least expensive path to net zero, I can imagine. No capex, it's all opex. And we can do this now. And I know we're investing huge amounts of money in hardware and carbon capture. Carbon abatement is where it's at. Mm -hmm. we, we are almost at time. Uh, there's one question I'd like for you to answer briefly. Um, what are your ambitions for AI? How far would you like to go? Uh, take the opportunity, there are researcher entrepreneurs in the room, so give us your, your wishes. I would start with Joseph, uh, since... Well, I don't, I'll be a little bit controversial. Um, Yokogawa, a little while ago, ran a chemical plant for 25 days without people operating it. It's all run by AI and automation. So it's definitely going there. And so, I think what we're trying to do as a company is trying to make AI accessible, have it impactful, but not just from an efficiency point of view, but also from a sustainability point of view. And this is our drive. 
And the things that we're doing is trying to connect all those dots. So enterprise integration is kind of very important. It's got to connect with your ESG reporting systems, your ERP systems, your HR systems, mm -hmm. all of it. So this is sort of our vision. And um, we're seeing that impact now. And yeah, good vision. I Fun. Think I think in the discrete manufacturing world, it's a little bit different. Things are a lot more primitive than, than, than what you just described. Um, there, there's a lot of adoption of what they call the Internet of Things. It still hasn't happened right, in a lot of the manufacturing plants I'm in. Things are very done, very manually, very, you know, ha very hands-on. Um, there's not a lot of adoption of that. So I think there, there's that. There's, I think we have to get through this transformation um, to using more digital data to help support um, people on the line, as I, as I mentioned earlier. And also, um, once we, we can bring all this together, I think we can, the use case that we just did, which we're trying to promote right now, is the, the whole idea of following standardized work and making that work. But I think we can take that in the future and extend it both ways up, up and down the value stream mm -hmm. by, by bringing more data sources in and, learn, and, and using technology to learn what the people need to know at the time they need to know it so they can apply it. And I'll use an analogy like we used to use um, very primitive mapping tools to get directions to how we get here with line by line instructions on MapQuest or whatever it is. Now we use Waze. And Waze just tells us turn left, turn right, turn. You don't even have to think, right? You just drive. And that's, that's where it's going uh, is you know, people on the plant floor who are your biggest asset, we just need to tell them where to go, where to turn, what to do to be efficient. Um, and we'll get there, but it's going to be a long journey. It's not going to happen next year. There's no, like, it's 10, 20 years away. Interesting. Philippe? Well, Marie-Claude, in my opinion, um, AI will evolve. Models will evolve. Whatever you're using today might not be the same solution that you're going to use in 20 years, but it's still AI and it powers a business case. And I'm bringing everything back to the business case. And what I think are the most exciting business case right now in the manufacturing domain is uh, tracking emissions and power consumption, as Joseph mentioned. It's super interesting to see where it goes. And I talked with a startup here called Citera. Uh, they're, they're here in the crowd right now. And they're, uh, they're just trying to, to build that up. And it's super interesting to, to see them evolve. So I'm really going to keep an eye on, uh, on them for sure. And tracking uh, human and bringing data into what human do into manufacturing plant, well, that's some, surely something that impresses me much. So I'm going to keep an eye on that with Pace Factory, uh, of course, as well. Thank you. Perfect. And we uh, can conclude. Yeah, conclude quickly on, uh, I think, bringing the manufacturing sector more data-driven. Uh, AI is definitely a tool that's going to benefit this. There's like Gen, Gen AI, ChatGPT, and all that. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's interesting also for the manufacturing. Do you want really to have a, a suggestion that you're 80%, 90% sure, or ask Joe with 20 years of experience and have the same, <laughs> same 80, 90% chance of doing the right thing on your machines. So there's a lot of, uh, I think it's going to be interesting to see those knowledgeable worker also uh, with tons of knowledge that are actually retiring. Uh, how do we deal with that? I think AI is going to help as well, uh, but you need to feed the data, again, data, data, data to, the, to those, uh, those systems so, so you can actually improve your, your shop floor. Uh, and just be more productive at the end of the day. Hmm. So a lot of humans in the future of AI. That's, that's cool. Let's hope so. Yeah. <laughs> We're still relevant. Yay. Still. <laughs> We're still relevant. Um, thank you for this uh, insightful discussion. Um, whoa. Oh, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> now let's turn to Felix belil dacril CEO and co-founder, who will introduce his startup, Axia. Thank you so much. So hi, everyone. My name is Felix. I'm CEO and co-founder of Axia, a software company that helped the purchasing team of manufacturing company to be more effective. So I have a background in mechanical engineering, and I used to work at Bombardier Aerospace. At the time, I was dealing with hundreds of different suppliers, and I was shocked to see that we were building the best aircraft in this category, but the way the information was gathered was mainly with email, telephone, and even faxes. And that information was stored with Excel spreadsheet and handwritten notes. And when we look deeper at the way the manufacturing industry managed their supplier network, there hasn't a lot of changes on that front. So the procurement team will spend a lot of time just gathering the information. But in the context of labor shortage, it's a big problem. Another big issue that they have is this information is stored inside the emails. So when you want to have a proactive way of fixing problems, it becomes really challenging and almost impossible. 
And because they're spending so much time on the first two elements, they're not able to invest in the relationship with their suppliers, which is really key to driving value in supply chain. So what we do at Axia, we take that same information and we bridge the gap with the supplier network. We automate the low-value tasks to get the prices, get the delays, track the orders, find which supplier is able to do the work, and we automate all of that. On top of that, we provide visibility, insights, and recommendation on where the team should be focusing their attention. Finally, by leveraging all those information, the team is able, is able to invest more time in the relationship with their supplier to be able to get optimal prices and delays. Basically, they are able to do in a few clicks what used to take them a few hours up to a few days. And by leveraging the information that we provide, they are able to get optimal prices and delays. A great example is Airbus. One of their team was in charge of ordering the parts just before they deliver the aircraft. It's a case where they need to move really quickly, and there's a lot of technical element. With the ramp up in activity, that team understood that they would be overwhelmed in the upcoming months. So they looked at Axia as a potential partner to fix that challenge. What we've done with the Airbus team is we took one of their key area of responsibility, which is placing the orders, and that task used to take 90 minutes, and with our technology, could be done in less than 10 minutes. On top of that, we were able to shorten the cycle from 25 days to less than 10 days to place those orders. But the most exciting part is that we were able to streamline all the information on our system and detect issues beforehand. With that information and the newly freed time, the team have been able to optimally select their suppliers and avoid the issues. So we have an easy to use platform, but on the back end, we have some AI models that have been trained on the millions of data points that we stream on our platform. Those models are able to detect the shape of a, a part understand the technical requirement in less than a second, and with that information, identify the right partners within the available approved supplier list. We're also able to detect beforehand the potential challenges, flag it, provide some recommendation to the users that is then able to take the best decision with all the context that they have, and this is really where we believe that human and users should be spending their time. So, if you're interested in learning how we're helping thousands of different manufacturing companies to optimize their procurement operation, please come see us afterwards at our booth. This was Felix from Axia. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you very much. So, to conclude our block on uh, manufacturing, I would like for us to turn our attention. Lubna Benalbu, researcher, professor of AI for supply chain management at Université de, du Québec à Rimouski, will give a snapshot of how researcher, uh, researchers think about challenges and opportunities in manufacturing. So you go ahead. Merci, Marie-Claude. So uh, thank you for uh, the, this discussion. It was really interesting. And what I want to share with you today is how AI is transforming the manufacturing sector, but specifically, I want to chat about opportunities and challenges. So artificial intelligence is a large area of research. And for me, it's um, a set of tools, a set of tools to resolve problems, a set of tools to make decisions. This is um, how uh, we are using AI in manufacturing. So typically, we are using the connectionist branch of artificial intelligence. It's machine learning. and Supervised learning to predict, for example, um, the indicator of performance in the manufacturing. Uh, I want to uh, maximize um, the revenue of my company, for example. It could be something that we are using in different level of decision in companies. And we can also use some unsupervised learning when we didn't have labels of data. For example, this morning, it was some discussion about aerospace industry uh, to predict uh, the time to failure for some companies we need to make some clustering before for equipment dependent to their criticity. So here we are using, for example, in supervised learning. And reinforcement learning is largely used in robotics. And more recently, we are speaking about generative AI. So we are using artificial intelligence algorithms to make decisions. And as you know, we have three levels of decision in manufacturing in general. So we have operational level, it's day to day, tactical level, and strategic level. And what we are uh, doing with the artificial intelligence algorithms, typically we are just interested to the parts of predictive 
you know, analytics. We are speaking about how we can predict our KPI. But to apply artificial intelligence in industry and to make decision, we need two other parts. The first part is about descriptive analytics, it's about diag diagnostic, and also to know what is the real problem, what happened. And after that, when we have the prediction of our indicator, we need to make decision. And it's not enough just to have some prediction. We need to know exactly which parameters I can uh, change, I can make to make this decision. And this is what we are speaking about, prescriptive analysis. This is the way what we are trying to do artificial intelligence to help people to make decision in manufacturing. So there is many benefits of applying artificial intelligence in manufacturing, in the literature, in our experience. The first one is about operational performance. So with uh, algorithms, we can reduce the production lead time, we can reduce the cost, but also we can improve the revenue. And other thing, there is the problem of labor shortage. We discussed with this, about this uh, um, in this uh, discussion. But my university is in the region of Saudi Arapalash. Saudi Arapalash is one of the most manufacturing regions here in Canada, and we are facing the problem of labor shortage. So last year, there was a study about how companies, they are seeing uh, the solution to this labor shortage, and they agreed that digitalization could be the solution to face that. The other thing is about sustainability. Artificial intelligence could help us in efficiency, in the productivity, so we can reduce the the volume that you are transporting, and also reduce the greenhouse emission. So as this morning, and now we're discussing with many applications of artificial intelligence in manufacturing, typically the first one is about the demand prediction. So the demand prediction is one of success story of applying artificial intelligence in manufacturing, because it's about time series, and we know very well to deal with time series with our algorithms. And robotization, automatization, yes. Quality control, quality control classically is about data. It's about statistical. So it's one area where we can intuitively apply artificial intelligence. And now we are speaking about predictive quality, and we have many, many interesting results in this field. Also predictive maintenance, we'll speak about this a little. After that, there is predicting monitoring in real time, digital twin, but the goal of this is to achieve operational excellence. We are in 2023, but we still speak about operational excellence. We still speak about continuous improvement, about quality management. And for me, artificial intelligence could help us to achieve this operational excellence. So when we are speaking classically about operational excellence, is the way how we will control the variability of our KPIs. And basically, in our experience, like 10 years, we were applying artificial intelligence in manufacturing. We develop a framework, a simple framework, uh, classic, like uh, the framework that you had in improvement quality. And this framework is based on three phases. The first one is descriptive analytics. Here, we try to understand the problem. As I told to my students in the classroom, um, applying artificial intelligence is a contact sport. You have to discuss with people, you have to be in the plant, you have to understand what is the real causes of the variability. And you are not ashamed to use some classical tools like uh, um, Ishikawa diagram, like uh, case and circles, just to discuss with people. And what is interesting with those discussions, we have many times many interesting variables that could help us to um, you know, for example, to achieve more interesting accuracy of algorithms, more than to have more complex architecture. And this is really interesting to respect the data. The data, they have many, you know, for example, we are speaking about people when they're doing um, artificial intelligence like black boards, it's not the mean. We need to understand what that means, the difference between humidity, between the temperature, is not just a label in our data set. And in this part, generally, we begin by, um, the phase of preparation we took us like 80% of the time, many descriptive analysis, many correlation, and also some feature engineering. When we prepared our data, it's, uh, no, it's not a linear you know, uh, approach. We can uh, come back to the first one, and we applied many, many, many algorithms. And here, what we need generally is to make a trade-off between the complexity and the explainability. Sometimes we need uh, an algorithm with uh, less accuracy but more explainability to make the decision. When we predict our uh, you know, KPI, for example, we need to optimize this KPI. 
Why? Because we need the, the, the value of decision variables. I want to make the decision. So predicting just a KPI is not sufficient for me as um, operation management. I need to know which decision variable I can't move just to achieve the optimized value for this KPI. So here I will show you some case study that we did. We are in Quebec. So the forest industry is really, really important. And uh, um, one challenge that we had in the forest industry, the moisture of the wood. So the moisture, this is what uh, uh, defined the quality and also the price of the wood. So in this problem, we, the question was, how can we monitor the mean moisture content to control the quality of the process? So we develop uh, an approach based on AI algorithms and we predict the mean moisture content every five minutes within 10 hours in advance, knowing exactly when to stop the drying process. And what was interesting in this project, we did it with people, with forestry engineers, with people from FP Innovation, and we validate each step of our results, and we have a simulation of the mean of the distribution of mean moisture in this case. Another example in chemical industry. So in this example, we try to uh, determine, to apply a strategy of predictive maintenance, to determine the time to failure of uh, critical equipment. So we begin with inspired layering to cluster those equipment. It's, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the first phase of diagnostic. After that, we do some pronostic by using many, many algorithms. And it was like, uh, in 2015, it was the first time for me to apply deep learning algorithms in industry, and it was amazing. Like, yeah, the results were so interesting because the nature of problem, here when we are using predictive maintenance, we try just to be in the time, the good time. Not too late, not too early. And we develop a solution when the, the operator, they can see all the parts of the descriptive. And after that, they can also, the evolution of, uh, you know, the time to fire for the equipment and how we can adjust this time with other equipment in the same, uh, you know, uh, time. This is what you are speaking. It's just about applying some machine learning algorithms. But sometimes we need to develop new algorithms. And this is challenging and exciting, you know, area is to hybrid between physical and EA models. Here for renewable energy, we have a project with Mila and the government of Quebec. It's in the largest CSP plant in the world in Morocco. Sadly, it's near the place when they had the earthquake. And in this project, we try to monitor the variability of a natural resource. We are speaking about solar irradiation. And for this, it was really, really difficult to just to use the classic algorithms. So we add the context in our algorithms, and we develop our new architecture depending on this concept. And we are really happy last week it was accepted at New Lips, so we present this paper. So we are doing, sometimes we are just applied research, but sometimes we need to use our hard tools to resolve some problem. And there is many, many issues about applying uh, artificial intelligence in industry. Typically, here we can, for example, there is some mismatch, there is insufficient skills at the interaction between AI and operation. And it's our responsibility as university, as academician, that our students, they need to know artificial intelligence before going you know, to the market. And also, there is many, many uh, challenge about uh, data all the time. And what we did in this last three years, we tried to develop an approach, a framework to help people not to stay just with the proof of concept. We want a strategy. So our strategy is based on foundation. We assess the maturity of the company. After that, we have the vision. What is the vision of digital transformation for your company? What is strategy? What is the revenue that we want from this digital transformation? And everything is about change management. I agree this morning they were speaking about that in the aerospace. Yes, it's about people. Digital transformation is not just about technology. It's about people. It's just like what we did before with ERP, what we did before with management quality. It's the same problem. So we need to change in terms of organizational behavior. We need working with people, but also in, uh, in terms of process, in terms of new thinking in this industry in general. And it's really important to have the risk management all in all this approach so we can not only manage the risk, but also there's many, many opportunities that we can have by applying artificial intelligence in manufacturing. So thank you for your attention. Thank you.
So it's the end for, for this, uh, this group. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Merci. Well done, Marie-Claude. Good panel. Thank you. Thank you so much.